Good morning. Please be seated. On behalf of the entire Durenberger family, a special welcome to all of you joining us here today for the Mass of Christian Burial for Dave. On behalf of Abbot John and the entire monastic community, unfortunately you're not seeing a, a lot of us because we have a bit of a, a COVID wave coming through the monastery, so there's not a whole lot of us around today. And unfortunately, Abbot John was not able to join us and preside at the liturgy. Welcome to St. John's. Thank you for coming to this sacred place to pray with Dave's family and to give him the send-off he deserves and that God welcomes. On behalf of the greater St. John's family, thank you to Dave's family for his service and witness to our community and the many ways he has served us. My name is Father Nick Gillespie. I'm the chaplain here at St. John's University. And while I might be the, the backup or pinch hitter, it is a wonderful opportunity to pray with you and most definitely an honor. This morning, before we begin our liturgy, we'll have a few reflections about Senator Durenberger by his family, by Senator Klobuchar and Minnesota Governor Tim Walls. So now I invite Charlie Dave, Mike, and Dan to come forward and offer your reflections. Good morning. My name is Charlie Durenberger. I am the oldest of Dave's four sons. When Dad was thinking about this Mass, he asked each of us to speak briefly on our thoughts about the importance to Dad of four imports, important facets of his life, community, friends, family, and faith. I wanted to speak to Dad's commitment to community in part because I believe his dedication to community was fostered here at St. John's, where I too developed an appreciation of community as modeled by the Benedictines under St. Benedict's motto of Ora et labora, prayer and work. Growing up with my dad and his parents, George and Isabel, and later during my four years at the prep school, I learned firsthand the special character of the St. John's community and how it helped shape the Durenberger family. There can be no doubt that dad's entire life was devoted to community service, work to improve lives at the local, state, and national levels. His decision to run for public office was based not on a need to feed his ego or gain attention for himself, but to use his talents and gifts to improve the lives of others through effective and compassionate legislation and regulation. He firmly believed that government had an important role to play in advancing the common good and improving the lives of all of our citizens, and he was especially motivated to protect and help the vulnerable and historically disadvantaged members of our communities. I believe that his public service and community work was motiv motivated by a desire to serve the Lord. As the Apostle Paul advised in his letter to the Colossian Church, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And Jesus himself said, whatever you do for the least of my brothers, you do for me. Aside from his professional life, Dad also devoted a huge amount of time to service on countless boards, commissions, and other community service organizations. I thought I knew about all of them until I read the book that he wrote with Lori Sturdivant and learned about a lot more. His devotion to community inspired me to pursue a career in public service. And I think one of his primary legacies lies in the large number of former Senate staff members who were similarly inspired and have made lasting impacts across our nation in government, private industry, nonprofits, and philanthropy. I know he was extremely proud of his staff and the work they did in his office and beyond. Dad instilled in us and those he mentored his sense of responsibility and desire to serve others. I pray that we will all continue to follow in Dad's lead in working to improve the lives of our neighbors and to leave the world better because we were here. My name is Dave Durnberger. 
and I'm the number two son of Dave Dornberger. As I look around this church right now, I see hundreds of Dad's friends. Each person here had a relationship with Dad, a meaningful one, such that he would consider you his friend. He loved each of you, and, we could, and he could recall the smallest bit of information, the most distant memory that strengthened the bond between you and him. I admired him greatly for this gift, and I've tried to emulate this in my life and demonstrate this for my kids. Many of you were at his 88th birthday party in August and listened intently to the amazing speech that he gave. He began the speech very intentionally by saying, welcome to all of you. It's a joy to see your faces. You are each a part of a family of friends who have shared and shaped my life and its values for all of my 88 years. He didn't start his message talking about his accomplishments or the things that he possessed or anything else that one might consider braggadocious. Rather, he started with what was such an important part of his life, his friends. Many years ago, my dad gave us a scarf that was given to him by the Dalai Lama. I wanted to understand the significance of this scarf, and so I asked him to write a note about it. We wanted to make sure that we would be able to share this with our children and their children so that they could understand what this was all about. And the note simply stated, this symbolic friendship scarf was received from the Dalai Lama on a visit to his home in Dar es Salaam, India in September 1989, signed David Dernberger. This was also the year that the Dalai Lama was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Dad considered the Dalai Lama his friend, and the Dalai Lama considered Dad his friend. Around that same time, Dad traveled to the Middle East, making several stops to meet with leaders of various countries. One of his final stops was in Jordan, where he met His Royal Highness King Hussein. After lengthy conversations regarding faith and relationships, they both became friends. This would be manifested on several occasions over the next 10 years. If you want to learn more about this, just corner Steve Moore sometime and ask him about this relationship. One of the things that I noticed about Dad early on was his ability to engage just about anyone in conversation. He would talk to them as if they were the only one in the room, and what they told him mattered. He was able to do this because he truly meant it. He wanted to get to know people, everyday people who drove cabs, worked on a farm, CEOs of health systems, or leaders of countries. Everyone provided him with the same opportunity to develop a relationship, to become a friend. Dad had an uncanny ability to extract details from somebody and then recall those details years later when he saw them again or when he was trying to make a connection to someone new. Many of you who have known Dad a long time also know that he almost always carried a felt tip marker and a note card in his shirt pocket. He was constantly taking notes. He wanted to not only remember specific things that someone had told him, but he wanted to be certain to follow up with that person or reference whatever it was that was said if and when the right time made itself available. Over the past 40 years, it seems that I constantly run into people that have their personal Dave Dernberger story. They inevitably considered him a friend. One day, many years ago, my wife Heather and I were up at the lake going for a walk with Dad and Susan. We came across a cabin with a new addition recently completed and Dad, being the expert trespasser that he was, decided to walk into the person's yard and have a closer look. As he was peering in, the homeowner came out to ask what we were doing. Dad immediately reached out to introduce himself and the owner said, I know who you are, stay right there. Oh, we didn't know whether to, to start running or to stay put. And the, the homeowner reappeared with a photo and handed it to Dad. It was a photo of the two of them and it said, to my good friend Lauren, Dave Dernberger. It suddenly hit my dad who this was, and he instantly recalled their meeting, what he did for a living, and likely something that he wanted to discuss professionally with him. Dad taught me to always try and remember one fact about someone. It can be as meaningful as the name of a child or as simple as the last location they saw one another. The ability to recall this fact seems to strengthen that relationship because it demonstrates the fact that you care. Relationships build trust and begin with the development of a friendship. Friendship begins with the intentional demonstration of caring about the person you are and the person that you're with 
at that moment. These relationships are never about what's in it for me, but what's in it for we. Dad was able to accomplish so much during his life because he had so many friends, so many relationships, so much trust built up. I know in my heart that Dad's charge to all of us as we leave this place and continue our lives would be for us to be intentional about how we treat one another and to always know that anyone has the potential to be a friend. Morning, everyone. My name is Mike Durenberger. I'm going to tell you what I think family meant to Dad. And to all of you and those of you who are joining us online, thank you for being here. Because for Dad, one of the greatest gifts you can give is your time. Like most suburban, young suburban families, ours was full of love. In the 1960s, we were blessed to be growing our roots in a quiet South St. Paul neighborhood next to the Fairhurst, a family with seven young children. We spent years playing in the yard, roaming freely through each other's homes. Sadly, when my brothers and I were three, five, six, and seven years old, cancer took our loving mother, Dad's beautiful wife, Judy. But Dad was the provider. He needed to forge ahead, keep his family together. And he couldn't wait to get home to see his boys. As the years went on and we played various athletics, Dad was there. And not just there, but he was engaging and supportive no matter how we were doing. After Dad had been beat down personally and professionally in the early 1990s, he married Susan Foote. And it was Susie who resurrected him and reinforced the importance of family, and Dad was reignited. I've been a drummer and percussionist for the last 45 years, performing in various bands and orchestras, and whenever I had a performance, he was there. I don't have kids of my own, but five years ago, when I married my childhood crush, Maggie Fairhurst, I became a stepfather to two teenagers. One of them, Josephine, now 19, is joining us from Australia, where she was born and now lives. After our marriage, Josephine lived with us for two years because before she moved back to Queensland. She is an avid rugby player who played while she was here in Minnesota. And yes, Dad was there and very engaged. Our son David, yes, another David, would often engage his step-grandfather in robust conversations. Our two Aussie kids fell in love with their new grandfather because, in the articulate words of close friend Steve Moore, he was so intelligent, so passionate, so selfless, so diligent, so exuberant, and so fun to be around. Dad's notion of family manifested outside of our own. Over the years since Dad left the Senate, I crossed paths numerous times with people who shared an anecdote about him. All were about how he helped them in one way or another. Most of those stories were about how he was instrumental in helping reunite their family fragmented by the immigration process. Dave Durenberger saw all Minnesotans as a family. Thank you for being here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dan Durenberger, or as many of you here know me as Danny Durenberger. I'm the baby of the family. Um, I'm number four, the one that was supposed to be the girl. So here I am. <laughs> That's OK. So my brothers and all of you have done an amazing job of talking about uh, the love that my dad had for community, for friends, and for family. So the question that I've been pondering for a while now is, where does that come from? Where did that passion that he had 
in all the ways that was just described and all the ways that we'll talk about this afternoon, where does that come from? I know exactly where that comes from. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's where that comes from foundationally. My dad loved all of you. He loved this community. He loved the state. He loved the United States Senate, of course. But there was a foundational love that really drove him. In Luke chapter 12, verse 48, it says, When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. That was a driving force in his life. Susie knows every day he got up and he read his Catholic devotion every single day diligently. And I remember that as a child growing up, seeing that. Those were seeds that were planted in my heart, which led me to the same beliefs and a similar foundation. So what does he do with this great responsibility that he's so passionate about? In 1 Peter chapter 4, I think it defines it very well. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. That is the key, the last part of that scripture. Everything you do will bring glory to God. So while my dad reflected and spoke often of his love for all of us in this community, at the core was his desire to bring glory to God. And he did this to all people. I've heard so many stories about people have said, I can't believe he stopped and talked to me and looked me in the eye and like he was present. This guy, this senator, talked to me and listened to me. In Rainy Lake, we were, would go there for fishing trips. And I remember one day we took a break. My dad said, let's probably no fish for biting. How he tried and tried, how he Hanson, but we couldn't get any on the line. So he said, we're going into town to see some friends. Okay, jump in the car, off we go. Drive up to this small house, walk in. Never met these people in my life. My dad acts like he's known him his whole life, like he does with all of you when he sees you. We walk to the back of the house, and there's a tiny room, and there's a young girl there who has special needs. She's paralyzed, and she's handicapped severely. As a young man, I didn't know how to respond to that. It was very challenging. My dad came right in, sat right on the edge of the bed, held her hand, talked to her, like it was his own child. That right there was the beginning of a transformation in, in my personal heart as to what it means to approach everybody with this love and this passion. And we all know where that passion led in terms of the ADA and so on and so forth. So I, for the last week or so, honestly have been praying to my dad and my father you know, Dad, what would you have us do here right now? For some reason, I'm supposed to speak on your faith. So what would you have us do? And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, it says, Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So dad, we know you fought the good fight as we read in 2 Timothy. You finished the race. You kept the faith. Now we know there is in store for you the crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge, has awarded to you on that day. Rest in peace, dad. We love you.
Thank you so much, Charlie, Dave, Mike, Dan. That was just beautiful. Um, and uh, it is an honor uh, to be here with all of you. Um, I want to thank the family for inviting me to say a few words and know that they understand, as Dave would, uh, that I have to go back to Washington for votes. I'm sure Dave would have an opinion on how I would vote. Um, and he might even have an opinion on the State of the Union that we're going to see uh, tonight. Um, it's also an honor to be here with Governor Walls and Gwen, uh, with former Governor Dayton, uh, Governor Pawlenty, thank you. Um, we also have here uh, Senator Boswich, I know is out there uh, somewhere, uh, former Congressman Kennedy, um, as well as uh, former Attorney General Humphrey, and I'm sure many others. It is only Dave that could bring this group together, uh, let me say that. Um, it is appropriate today that we are celebrating Dave's life at St. John's because in so many ways, uh, Dave was St. John's. He was raised here by his parents. I know a few of you shared stories with me today about George and Isabel, uh, faculty members and what characters they were. And as a student at St. John's Prep and St. John's University, he grew up fully immersed in the Benedictine values of faith, listening, respect, stewardship, and justice. Those values shaped everything he did. And I remember him inviting me to breakfast, and I hear there's a picture of this documenting this on the wall of the restaurant um, right when I got elected. And he had specific lessons he wanted to share with me. And one of them um, was about how Washington can eat you up, basically, um, and how that value of stewardship um, can be um, sadly missing. And so he talked to me, one, about his beautiful staff, and so many of you here. Um, he talked about Susan. He talked about uh, everything uh, that was good in his life that was a touchstone. And then he gave me a small volume called The Teachings of Jesus. And he told me to keep that with me all the time. He told me to get involved in the prayer breakfast, uh, which I did. I took his advice from the first week I was there at the Senate prayer breakfast. Two years later, I was chairing it uh, with Johnny Isaacson, and Dave was so proud of that. And I would look at those teachings of Jesus, especially when things got really bad. And one stood out for me because it's so Dave from Matthew 5:16. let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's Dave. Through the bluster of Washington, he found ways to bring those Benedictine values and that tradition of a belief in public service to the rest of the country. And in sticking to those values of stewardship, he made such incredible progress. Dave took volunteerism seriously. I think we all know that because we know what he did both before he got into public service and what he did after. He paired up with Paul Wellstone on the legislation that created AmeriCorps. As a result of their efforts, millions and millions of Americans have gotten the support they need to better their communities. His devotion to stewardship is also clear when you look at what he did to promote conservation. It was in that spirit that he worked as a senator to successfully secure protections for the Boundary Waters, for Voyagers National Park, the Mississippi River. Maybe he just always imagined that these 14 tallest grandchildren I have ever seen in my life um, would be able to enjoy that, as would so many Minnesotans, uh, for generations to come. And you simply can't talk about Dave's time in Washington without talking about what he did uh, to advance the rights of those with disabilities. From his faith, and Dan uh, referenced this, of the story of him with the young girl, from his faith he carried with him the values of justice and respect for all people. Uh, from his time in Governor Lavander's office working on disability issues, he carried with him a steadfast commitment to improve the lives of those with disabilities across our country. Once through his work in the governor's office, 
Dave visited a hospital where he saw disabled patients, and in his words, they were warehoused. Most of them, he said, naked. He knew that as a society, we had to do better, and in Washington, he saw to it that we did. Through his leadership on the Americans with Disabilities Act, he ushered in a whole new era of disability rights, one where people in wheelchairs were trapped in their homes as a result of ramps, one where disabled people weren't systematically excluded from the workforce, and one where the destitute facilities that once motivated him to take action were phased out in favor of community residential treatment. In the years that followed, he found a loving partner in Susan whose dedication to mental health reform eventually led her to write her book, The Crusade for Forgotten Souls, a rich history of the campaign to provide dignified care to Minnesotans with disabilities. From the outside, Dave's work looked like the manifestation of faith in action, but the way he saw it, he was just doing his job the good deeds, letting his light shine onto others. When Dave left the Senate, he could have been bitter, he could have just hidden away, but he didn't. He called me for that breakfast. He would call me and ask, what are you guys doing now? He would have all kinds of opinions of things. I would explain a senator that was blocking something, and he, with that belly laugh, would say, that guy was like that from the day he started in the Senate. He did not stop mentoring and trying to do good. And as a result, he did good. Because he had a higher purpose, he found new ways to improve people's lives as an educator, a husband, a dad, and yes, a grandpa. I will always remember the best welcoming Dave with his students when he would come uh, to Washington and bring in every year a new class of people who were learning from him. Dave lived every day of his life guided by the values he learned at St. John's, and they stuck with him until the very end. So today we celebrate Dave Durenberger, a man whose higher purpose led our country to a higher ground. Thank you. Good morning. Every father should be so lucky to have their sons speak the words that we just heard here, trying to encompass a life lived so large and so well, and have your sons articulate it in a way that um, I don't think many of us could imagine. Susan and to the family, Gwen and I express our deepest sympathies to you. Um, and I'm sitting here listening to, of course, he was friends with the Dalai Lama because he was Dave. Um, and no one in here, no one in here batted an eye about that. <laughs> it was, it was self-evident. And, and as you heard so eloquently put out, Dave's ability to be in the moment with anybody. And you can rest assured that the person that he met in a coffee shop in Albert Lee had the same attention that the Dalai Lama had. Um, this past week, as word spread of Dave's passing, in different situations, I was running into Minnesotans who were bringing it up and talking about, about this life and about Dave. And as Dave's good friend, Lori Strudeman pointed out, it went well beyond a nostalgia for a simpler time or a wishfulness that we wouldn't have to deal with things today. That's not what people were expressing. They were expressing what Lori said. They want more Dave Durenbergers. They could feel it in their soul that this was different. This was an individual who did things differently and did it in a way that made people feel valued or feel part of something bigger than themselves. So as the family mourns, the state mourns along with you. And I think as Dave would hope he was not that interested in nostalgia and looking back. 
He was in the moment. As Senator Klobuchar stated, I believe Dave Influence grew post-Senate. And I watched this as a new member of Congress. And for some of you maybe to know, and I, again, I thank the family for sharing this incredible man. My father died when I was a teenager, and I got into this business a little late. There was a gap where I really didn't have any mentors. And I said, the two that I often found myself turning to, and I don't want to pin the blame on Dave that, that I was calling, so those of you who are mad about the things I did, Dave was giving me other advice, just so you know. But it was him who was there. And he was concerned, yes, as an individual, but he was concerned if someone going into public service needs to see things as clearly as possible. So I got a little bit difference with the felt tip pen and the cards. I got notes on there of things to read, which was a nice nudge to, you need a little more education on this. Maybe spend a little more time on this. Or, as Dave was always curious, articles that he had circled or tore out or handed to you to make sure you were seeing things that way. And in my family, a family of teachers, the highest praise you should get was, that's a really fine teacher. Dave Durmerger was a really fine teacher. And I watched this in D.C. as he would bring healthcare professionals to have the forums in D.C. And that room, people would trickle in and sit in the back, members of Congress, Senate, cabinet officials, experts in think tanks would come in to listen to Dave talk about the practical application of healthcare and the impact it had on people's lives. And the patience and the kindness. Dave could, Dave could have won any debate he was in. He was smarter. A lot of people think, especially elected officials, think they're the smartest person in the room. Dave actually was. That was what the difference was. But he would never try and win the debate. That wasn't the goal. The goal was to give other points of view, to bring people in, to find that common space. And during the summer of 2010, I drew upon that friendship. And if some of you recall, that was the summer of the town halls and healthcare debates. Seems kind of quaint now, I know, that that was considered really crazy times. But I called Dave and I said, Dave, I'm going to do a town hall. Nobody had done one. I said, somebody's got to lance this boil and have a conversation about where this is going. And I said, I'd really like you to come and, and moderate that for me. And of course he said, oh, sure, I'd be glad to. He said, but I, you know, you know I'm pretty tall. I'm not very wide. I don't think I'll make a great human shield for you. So <laughs> Dave was very politically astute. He knew why the call was coming for several reasons. But the call was really coming because in a heated moment, that a small town hall turned into 3,000 people passionately expressing their views. The calm at the middle of that storm was Dave Durenberger, asking people to respect their neighbors, to listen to different points of view. And that was meant to be a 90-minute meeting down there in Mankato. I looked at Dave after the 90 minutes, and he just says this, which in Dave parlance was not to wrap it up, let them go. It's their town hall. Three and a half hours later, Dave was still standing, still helping Usher answer questions and moderate the debate. He did not see politics on this linear scale where you could fit somebody in and call it good, or you could walk up to him and decide, I know whether I like this person or not. Certainly there were those that said, as Dave was a progressive on environmental issues, oh, we'll embrace him in. But be very clear, Dave had very conservative views that he was very proud of and kept. And he used that as an opportunity to bring a lot of folks into a place they weren't normally comfortable with. That's a very fine teacher. That's a really good person. And I think one of the last times, I believe it was the last time I had the privilege to be with Dave, it was a campaign event in September. It was a warm, early fall day, leaves are beginning to change. We're in the backyard of a St. Paul house, crowded with people back there, full, full to the gills. Pretty broad political spectrum that was there, and Dave was there as a the guest, and I had the privilege of he was going to introduce me. And before we started, he was sitting there, and he had the persona of the elder statesman. People were in awe that Dave Durenberger was there. Um, and he turned to me and he says, you know, when I was younger, I had hopes of being governor. And I want to thank you because your first term cured me of that in every way. <laughs> so and I said, well, thanks, Dave. And, but then he proceeded to do what I'd seen him do on several occasions. Years earlier, on a campaign trail for Congress down in Albert Lee, and he did it again this night. People asking or blaming or saying, 
Our political division is so big, I hate it. I hate it. I hate this. I'm just tired of it, frustrated and all of this. And Dave, in his calm way or whatever, was quick to point out, we all are, and because of that, we all have a responsibility to fix it. Because when they were asked, people wanted a simple answer, and he would just say, no, it's up to each of us. It's us to have a higher expectation, to have a higher expectation of not just an elected office, but what we expect out of this. And it goes back to what you heard. They believed that government could be a tool of good because it was us. And there was an expectation that all of us would participate in that. And it was a moving moment because I think a lot of people understood and they knew Dave was getting on. He was more fragile than they'd seen him. This big, tall, overpowering and the voice that could boom through the room. It was a little quieter that night. He was a little more, he sat on the chair a little bit. But it was hushed in that backyard. And it's what, again, that I think Lori Studevant wrote about is, in that moment you could feel, why can't we have more Dave Durenbergers? And I think his point was, we can. If each of us try and decide how this can be, try and decide how we can make life a little better, try and decide the moments that Dave understood. It might have been, and you think about this, he might have had a one-minute conversation with that gentleman that you heard talked about, but that photo was in that gentleman's house and it meant something because Senator Dave Durenberger talked to him. And I can tell you, and many of us know this, people are angry and they express their opinions, but many times there's things in their life that we can't know what they're going through. We don't know what they're experiencing personally. And it always felt to me like Dave was able to see by that and see the humanity. So lots of things and lots of descriptions about Dave Durenberger, his wisdom, his humor, his humanity. But the word that got said a lot here earlier was he felt like a friend to everyone. And I'll tell you, in a chaotic world where life can be pretty tough, a good friend is hard to find. And when you find one, you know it's special. Minnesota lost that friend, but again, if this last week was any indication, there is a hunger for each of us to try and find a little bit of what Dave just exuded naturally and be a little bit better friend. So Susan and the family, thank you for sharing this incredible friend with Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie, Dave, Mike, and Dan, Senator Klobuchar, and Governor Walls for helping all of us better understand Dave's passion for service, for faith, for family, and for presence. Uh, greatly appreciated as we enter into this liturgy. I invite you now to please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. In the waters of baptism, David died with Christ and rose with him to new life. May he now share with him eternal glory. In his baptism, David was clothed with a white garment. We now clothe him on this, his last day, with another white garment in remembrance of his resurrection.
Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, it is our certain faith that your Son who died on the cross was raised from the dead, the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep. Grant that through this mystery, your servant Dave, who has gone to his rest in Christ, may share in the joy of his resurrection. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. This passage is from Isaiah, which was one of my grandpa's favorites, and he and his companions always ended their trips to Africa by reading it. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song, and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Where there once were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name, and they will be an everlasting sign of his power and love. The word of the Lord. Shepherd, be O God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death into life. Shepherd, be O God, beyond my wants, beyond my fears, from death. my shepherd, so nothing shall I want. I rest in the meadows of faithfulness and love. I walk by the quiet waters of peace. Shepherd, be you raise me and heal my weary soul. You lead me by pathways of righteousness and truth. My spirit shall sing the music of you. Oh. 
should wander the valley of death. I fear no evil, for you are at my side. Your rod and your staff, my comfort and my reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, if God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but handed him over for us all. Will he not also give us everything else along with him? Who will bring a charge against God's chosen ones? It is God who acquits us. Who will condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, rather, was raised, who also is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will anguish or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? No. In all these things, we conquer overwhelmingly through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor present things, nor future things, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of our Lord. and the life says the Lord those who believe in me will live forever The Lord be with you a reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. 
so that the Father will give you whatever you ask Him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Listen carefully, my son, to the Master's instructions, and attend to them with the ear of your heart. This is advice from a Father who loves you. Welcome it, and faithfully put it into practice. St. Benedict begins his rule, which is this small book which guides our monastic and our Christian life together. He begins his rule with words that echo our first reading. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live, so that you may do God's word. As I read about Dave Dernberger and prepared for today, and let me assure you there are many monks in the monastery who offered a bevy of stories about your family, it became clear to me He was a man accustomed to listening deeply with the ear of his heart to the people and the world around him. However, it quickly became clear that listening wasn't enough. Dave had a special skill of putting his faith, what he had heard from observing the world, and putting it into practice through a life of public service and as a husband, a father, a grandfather, a friend, and a colleague. Susan, Charlie, David, Michael, Daniel, Benjamin, and Rebecca, along with your spouses and your children and your grandchildren, on behalf of the entire St. John's community, I offer our heartfelt condolences for the loss of a man who took St. Benedict's instructions to heart. Now, a number of people have pointed me back to Dave's interview with Minnesota Public Radio's Gary Eichton about his role in the Senate. It seems clear to me that for Dave, listening clearly meant being in relationship, opening your heart to the other. So I'll quote loosely, and maybe uh, I'm not shape shifting, I don't think, but at least quoting loosely. Dave said, You are going to be remembered for all those relationships, built one person at a time, one incident at a time, or one problem at a time, one challenge at a time. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Stearns County Commissioner, the Governor of the State of Minnesota, a U.S. Senator, you want to be remembered for how solid those relationships were and how faithful you were to the commitments that you made. Dave modeled listening by building strong relationships with those around him. And as, as we have heard today already clearly, even those with whom he may have disagreed. This way of living reminds me of our second reading. Nothing. Not present things, nor future things, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Dave's ability to see the Christ in the other, which is core to our Benedictine way of thinking, reflecting our values of respect of persons and awareness of God, His ability to see Christ in the other, to appreciate differences, and model bridge building should give all of us hope today. Because not even in life nor in death will those bonds of relationship be separated from the love of God or from the love of us who mourn him today. The message of hope for us today is that we can be assured that God has granted Dave the abiding bond of love. 
Nothing can get in the way of it. As I mentioned before we began our liturgy today, Abbot John wanted very desperately to be here to celebrate with you, Dave's family. And in fact, I think he had prepared much of his homily, which he sent me. So to make my work easier, I'd like to lift a bit of his own homily. Abbot John wrote the following. It is easy to believe in God when everything is going well. When we're driving down the road and all the lights are turning green and everyone is telling us we are great. When it really does seem that nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's another thing when our son or daughter gets hurt or our spouse dies of cancer or even myself get on the wrong path. David knew all these tests in his life, and he landed in a faith in God that was deeply relational. As the gospel put it, you are my friends if you do what I command you. I no longer call you slaves, but I call you friends because I've told you everything that I've heard from my Father. And this is what I command you, love one another. In the ups and downs of life, Dave never forgot this command to continue to love. And may we too take from his model and share that more generously with all those around us, most especially those we find challenging. There is no doubt in my mind that the more I have learned about Dave and the way he chose to live his faith in service to others, the more I could sense how truly he was a son of St. Benedict. Growing up in Flinttown, I think we've overbuilt on the same site by this point, attending St. John's Prep School and St. John's University, and going on to be someone who gave himself tirelessly for the betterment of others. He understood that St. Benedict challenges us to bring our whole self our gifts, and our challenges into our life of faith. St. Benedict is beautiful in this regard. He invites humans to be a part of his monasteries and his Benedictine communities. Dave did so as well. And he put those beliefs and values into practice. So if St. Benedict commands us to listen at the beginning of his rule. He ends that same chapter, the prologue, by telling us what we should do when we hear the Lord calling us forth. So I quote St. Benedict. But as we progress in this way of life and in faith, we shall run on the path of God's commandments, our hearts overflowing with the inexpressible delight of love. Never swerving then from his instructions, we shall through patience share in the sufferings of Christ that we may also deserve to share in his kingdom. We are here today as Christians for this mass of Christian burial because we believe Dave will share in God's kingdom. And as all of us continue to mourn the loss of Dave, I encourage you to keep listening to his instructions and the words of God the Father who loves you, telling us that all of us one day will share in the kingdom of light that Dave now knows most fully. May one day God bring all of us to everlasting life. Please stand. My dear friends, as we thank God for the gift of David's life and his trust in the resurrection of Jesus, 
In confidence, we now turn to our loving God and place our needs before him. The response to the following intentions will be, Lord, hear our prayer. Today, we entrust Grandpa Dave into God's loving care. We thank God for the gift of his life. Welcome him now into your heavenly home where he will know peace and happiness forever. We pray to the Lord. For David, a loving husband, father, grandfather, brother, uncle, colleague, neighbor, and friend. May he be held forever in God's love embrace. We pray to the Lord. For all those who loved my grandpa and grieving his passing, may we feel God's healing power and comfort one another in this time of pain and loss. We pray to the Lord. David served generously in his legal work with various Minnesota governors and as a dedicated, long-serving senator for our state and our country. Bless all the women and men who dedicate their lives through their service, either publicly or privately, to make this world a better place for all of us. We pray to the Lord. David loved sharing his expertise and experiences in the world of academia through numerous speaking events, civic engagement, and also by creating individual connections. Bless all those who commit their lives to teaching and mentoring others. We pray to the Lord. For all who care for the sick and the aged, and for all who attended to the needs of Grandpa Dave during the last weeks of his life, that they may be granted the grace, patience, and understanding needed to continue their compassionate care. We pray to the Lord. Confident in your mercy and love, hear the prayers for this family, which we now offer in silence. We pray to the Lord. Loving God, you listen to the love and the cry of your people. Hear the prayers we offer for David. Look on him with your infinite love and bring him to the fullness of life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
Please stand. Pray, sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Look with favor, O Lord, on your servant David, for whom we offer the sacrifice of praise humbly entreating that reconciled with you through these devoted offices, he may merit to rise again to life, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For as one alone he accepted death, so that we might all escape from dying. As one man he chose to die, so that in your sight we might live forever. And so in company with the choirs of angels, we praise you as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving you thanks, gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, 
Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son and his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the offerings of your church in recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. John the Baptist, St. Scholastica, St. Benedict, St. David, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, Donald, our Bishop, the clergy, nuns, sisters, monks, public servants, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Remember your servant David, whom you have called today from this world to yourself. Grant that he who was united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection, when from the earth he will raise up in the flesh those who have died and transform our body after the pattern of his own glorious body. To our departed brothers and sisters, too, especially those who have preceded David in death, and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory when you will wipe away every tear from our eyes. For seeing you, our God, as you are, we shall be like you for all the ages and praise you without end. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, forever and ever. Amen, 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 amen. Following a St. John's tradition, we'll take our Lord's Prayer here just a little bit slower than we're used to in our parishes, okay? At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other a sign of Christ's peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the one who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. But only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. For communion today, if you believe that this is the body and blood of Christ, you are welcome to receive. If you'd rather receive a blessing, you're welcome to do that as well. Just come forward with your arms crossed. And if you feel more comfortable just remaining in your seat, you're welcome to do that as well. I think as Dave would say, he would prefer all feel welcome in this place. May the body and blood of Christ keep us safe for eternal life. Amen.
let us pray. Renewed by this life-giving sacrament, we pray, O Lord, that the soul of our brother David, to whom you gave a part in your covenant, may be purified by the power of this mystery and rejoice without end in the peace of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. A few announcements. At the end of Mass, as the procession moves out of the Abbey Church and into the baptistry, all guests are welcome to congregate underneath the bell banner outside as we take David's casket to the hearse. The cemetery will be a private service for just David's family. However, in the spirit of Benedictine hospitality, we do invite all of you to join us right next door in the Great Hall for some refreshments and a lunch after the liturgy today. David's family will join you there shortly, and I'm sure they would love to see many of you. On behalf of the Durenbergers and all of us at St. John's, thank you for your presence here today to celebrate David's life of family and service and for his Christian witness that God raises up all who have died and that we too will join them in one day. Before we go our separate ways, let us take leave of our brother. May our farewell express our affection for him. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet him again when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself. Let us now pray for David in silence. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother Dave in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you have bestowed upon David in this life. They are signs of your goodness and our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant, 
and help us who remain to comfort one another with the assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brother forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. In peace, let us now take our brother to his place of rest. 